You're listening to The Taste Podcast. I'm Editor-in-Chief Matt Rodbard, here with Senior Editor Anna Hiesel. Anna, our last interview. It's the last one. It's us interviewing each other. I mean, it's it's bittersweet. So we, we, we made it through 70. We launched the podcast over a year ago. So I think if you're listening to this episode, you, you probably have listened to a few episodes of our podcast and maybe have, have shared some moments with us, Anna. They, they, the listener has. They have. They know us by at this point. <laughs> they have a little insight into our personality. I think so. Someone stopped me at a party and, like, recognized my voice. That's happened to me, too. It uh, will never happen again, probably, but I thought that that was pretty cool. Shout out to that listener if you're listening now. So why are we stopping the podcast? First, we moved offices. We moved into a really cool new office in Greenpoint in Brooklyn. We did. We were in Midtown for, a, I was there for almost three years uh, and doing taste out of the Penguin Random House offices. But we've been incredibly lucky to move in um, to this really cool loft space in Greenpoint. And we're working with our friends at Punch closely, um, who we've always worked with. But it, we're kind of formalizing the relationship a little better. And it's it's extremely exciting. And I think uh, if, you, if you're reading Taste for the coming months, you'll, you'll definitely see some, some changes, some enhancements. You'll see some great stories. And if you follow us on Instagram, you'll probably see a lot of slices from Polyjuice Slice Shop, <laughs> is my prediction. And D&D? D&D, for sure. And tourist. I'm going to tourist for lunch today. Oh, I've heard amazing things. Yeah. The yeah, we have a lot to eat in Greenpoint. We're bra- we have our work cut out for us. <laughs> yeah, sorry. We're bragging about our new office digs. Sorry, Midtown folks. We also, we have our book coming out, which I think we, we've kind of mentioned casually online um, and in the pages of Taste or the online and Taste. But that's going to be a big moment in September. Anna's, you're the author of Lasagna. Talk about it a little bit. It's a book about lasagna and many other baked pastas and a few other things that you might love from your favorite Italian restaurant. We have like a really awesome classic iceberg uh, lettuce salad, some really great garlic knots. Um, But it's been such a fun project that I have been working on with my other editors at Taste. And we're so excited about it. It's coming out September 10th. Yeah, and it's the first of many books to to kind of launch out of taste, and we we're busy preparing those. So I think that's another reason we're kind of pivoting away from the podcast is that we just just don't have like twenty eight hours of the day. We have to take a few breaks. We can't do everything. We're focusing on books. We're t- focusing on t- on taste editorial. Thanks for listening yeah. all of these past 70 episodes. Thanks for following along with us. We have talked to some really interesting writers, chefs, thinkers in the industry. Yeah, we wanted to go over a couple of our favorites just as like a, l- a look back at our, our episodes. Uh, I wanted to shout out a few of my favorites, and I know, Anna, you have a few. Yeah, what's your first one? It's hard. I mean, we did. There's been so many great guests here, and we've been really lucky that they've they've been able to to make it up to our studio. I mean, the first one is probably the first one we launched, which was Samin Nasrat. We did an interview with her at Books Are Magic, uh, where we recorded several of our podcasts, especially in the early days. It was way before Netflix. Way before Netflix. It was for the release of Salt, Acid, Heat, Fat. Did I get that right? Salt, Fat, Acid, Acid Heat. heat fat. Damn it. I always do that. I still do that. And I've watched every one of her episodes on Netflix. The cool thing about Samin, really, she hasn't changed. She's gotten so big and she's famous now. Really, she's seriously famous. Uh, And I ran into her recently and, you know, we did the interview a year and a half ago. She was cool then. She's cool now. Says a lot about somebody who doesn't change a bit with celebrity and fame. For sure. And she has another cookbook coming out. Yeah, she's doing several books, and I'm sure they'll be coming out in several years. And uh, so, and I think she's doing another season of her show. I just, I really liked that conversation in front of a live audience because there were people in that room who'd followed her during her time at Chez Panisse, 
uh, their friends from San Francisco there. There's just a really good energy in the room, and I just I just love that interview. And we made everyone in the room do a salt tasting. Do you remember that? <laughs> everyone tasted salt. That's right. I brought two boxes of salt, and we passed it around. Yeah, that was fun. I love that. Anytime you're making something, whatever it is, you can't get there unless you know what there is. And this is not to say that like all artists know what their finished painting will look like, but you probably can envision or feel the feeling of what you want it to feel like. Or, you know, you have something that is your guide, your internal compass saying, oh yeah, I'm, I'm veering off course or no, I'm staying on the path. And so with cooking for me, you know, I always encourage people to be curious, to go out to eat in foods of new cultures, to travel, to try new things. And the more of that that you do, the more rich and um, richly detailed your mental filing cabinet of taste cards will be. And so you will always have these memory taste cards and you'll remember, oh, well, that time I was in Vietnam sitting on the beach eating the most delicious shrimp roll. I want that taste. So you can pull that taste up and go for it. And if you know that the four things that will help you get that taste are salt, fat, acid, and heat, and that the flavors of Vietnam, the the flavors that those guys would probably use are fish sauce and cilantro and I don't know, I'm not that you know, sorry, I don't know what all the Vietnamese flavors are off the top of my head, but you can look them up in my book on the thing and then, <laughs> or the, or the internet or a Vietnamese cookbook or go to Vietnam or anything. Then you can travel, you can travel this path or you can open recipes and be able to, you know, the person might say, add two tablespoons of salt. And you're like, well, if I add two tablespoons of salt, is there really going to be room for me to add fish sauce too? And I want that fish sauce because that's the Vietnamese taste. So you can use your judgment more and, um, so I think knowing what it is that you're after, knowing that you're after browned skin and a tender inside meat on your chicken, or knowing that it's at, you're after, I don't know, whatever, like a really bright salad, then you can go toward that. But if you don't know where you're headed, how do you know if you're on the right path? Anna, what's one of your favorites? Um, I loved talking to Dory Greenspan. Uh, I've been following her writing for a long time. She's written a lot of cookbooks about baking. And part of what was so fun of, about this conversation is that she told some stories about working at the Food Network right at its launch, like a few months before and a few months after. Um, she didn't own a TV at the time. She had to buy a TV <laughs> for this like new job she got. Uh, and she just like talked about sort of making this scrappy show, desperately hoping that um, someone would make it, someone would become famous. And fast forward mm-hmm. a few years and there's Emerald. So it's just like a really exciting time full of energy, mm-hmm. kind of like making, scrapping together yeah. this show every day. I remember that was a great moment about early Food Network. But we also, you also talked about her baking legacy because her cookbooks – are are legendary. Yeah, and she splits her time between New York and Paris, so we talked about pastry for sure, some of the pastries she's keeping an eye on, some of the things she's sick of. Rough life, Dory. What was the Food Network like 25 years ago? It was a kind of crazy place. When we started, we were in a studio that might have been somebody's one-bedroom apartment. It was really – it felt like, like, hey, kids, let's put on a show. It felt very scrappy. It was very scrappy. It felt very exciting because there really wasn't – there wasn't food television. We had fabulous shows on public television in the mold of Julia Child and really, you know, beautifully produced food. This was really a startup in every sense of the word. And it was exciting to be doing something new. It was exciting to be working with people who thought, we're breaking new ground. We're pioneers. We're going to make something. What else? Who else did you interview? So many. I think uh, one I really liked was Pete Wells. Um, Pete, I've, I've, I've been reading him for years, and we got him to come in. And we talked 
about his process. And I think that's really interesting, especially for nerds um, out there like myself who who read the the Times and, and are interested in the, the art of restaurant reviewing. And we had this theme that went throughout uh, our, our conversations with critics. And we interviewed many of them, um, Hannah Goldfield, Bill Addison, Robert Sietzema, Solejo. So we interviewed a lot of great critics, and it was kind of a little bit of a, a mini theme with the Taste Podcast. But we talked about New York and how, you know, it's a really tough time right now for small business owners in New York and with real estate and just the changing face of restaurant culture. And I asked him what the new mayor of New York, when that individual is elected, what can they do to save New York? And it was a great response. And I think through our conversations with many of these critics in New York, we got a little bit of a sense of, of, of hope that there is a way that some of these small business owners could be, could, could survive. One of the things that I thought was really funny about Pete Wells's interview and that I loved about it is that so many of our previous episodes, um, he kind of was like this quiet character in the conversations. I remember he came up in a conversation with Angie Marr he came up in conversation with Julia Moskin. Lots of the chefs we've interviewed have mentioned him. So he's been this kind of like quiet, mysterious figure throughout the show. And then we finally got a chance. You got a chance to sit down with him and talk to him. Yeah. And we talked about the scheduling, too. Yeah. Oh, just like finding time <laughs> to eat out and like figuring out how to fit it all. How in. do you do 27 meals a week? It's, it's, it's remarkable that he can do it. What is exciting anyway? Is 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 novelty exciting? Like that's one of the things that that gets people out to restaurants. Like, oh, I've never tasted this before. Or, this combination of ingredients is completely new to me. Or this is a new neighborhood where I've never eaten before. But then it's only novel once. You know, it's only like like things are only new the first time. And I think we have this crazy uh accelerated cycle in in the in the food world at least in New York where like everybody wants to go to the new place and then 3 months later it's done Anna what's another one of your favorites Um on the topic of the New York Times I talked to Julia Moskin a little over a year ago we had you probably remember we had a big party at the Bell House to launch the podcast uh with our friends at Bon Appetit and I interviewed Julia Moskin which was the same week that she had just won a Pulitzer so it was like <laughs> wow a really exciting time in her career I mean it still is she's doing amazing work but we talked about some of her investigative journalism and sort of just like balancing writing about crime in the restaurant industry with like, you know, getting to profile Guy Fieri mm-hmm. and like. And then home cooking stories, which she's so passionate about too. Yeah. It's absolutely. a really. Like testing soup recipes. Like yeah. How you kind of balance those things. She mentioned, did she ever write that story about Publix? Oh, I don't know. She did mention in that yeah. interview um, needing to travel to take a cooking class at Publix. Publix. So I've been thinking about that idea that she gave. And I was like, has she done that? Because I kind of want to do that story. We should check in on that. I know. We should yeah. think, Is this fair territory for taste to take it or whatever? But I think she's so full of ideas and the Times is doing amazing work. And it was that was a great interview. writing an article about Chinese barbecue <laughs> at the same time that I am researching the difference between Atlantic and Mediterranean tuna at the same time that I'm trying to figure out when I can go to Atlanta to take a cooking class at a Publix. Um, <laughs> and, you know, keeping up with all of my procrastinating takes a lot of time. Um, and that, I think, is the other thing about being a food writer is that, you know, you don't sit around, get to, like, sit around thinking about pancakes, and you don't just, like, go and have a meal and then contemplate it. It's it's the writing, you know, seven stories at a time that is really the challenge of of being a food writer, of, a, of any kind of journalist. Um, and, you know, the food is a great perk. I'm not complaining about my job, but it is still work. Well, 
One of my definite favorites was at the end of last year when Helen Rosner was here. And Helen, we had like it was a we, it was a funny interview. We we kind of like our schedules got mixed, and we got we had a really tight tight time. The studio was kind of uh, we had thirty minutes to do it, and it was really fast. And Helen talks very fast, as do I, and we got it done. Um, I just love we went over the year in food media and, and there's lots of thoughts. I definitely mentioned and admitted that I mute her on Twitter. That's the only time on this podcast that's ever happened. <laughs> that admission. No, but I think I, the takeaway was that I love her Twitter so much. I really do. I read it. I just actually read it as a digest and I read it like once a day. I really go back to it. It's really fun. Uh, but she, she, the work she's doing at The New Yorker um, and the writing that she does on Deadline, I think that's one thing that Helen has uh, really done an excellent job with with her role at The New Yorker. Tell me, I just wanted, I just, it was like a fun question. What was the greatest thing on Twitter this year that happened to you? Um, well, the greatest thing that happened to me personally was that earlier this year, I wrote a story and also tweeted, which then led to the story about how um, when I make roast chicken, I use a hairdryer to dry the chicken. I think people who kind of fundamentally understand cooking and chicken in a certain way were like, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. You want the skin to be really, really dry. And a lot of people were like, why are you cooking the chicken with your hairdryer, which evidence is a sort of misunderstanding of how hair dryers work. Um, but there was a, a fascinating um, slice of people who were really mad at me for doing this logical and effective thing who were not concerned that like the hair dryer itself was a problem or drying the chicken was a problem. They were really concerned about like the san like the kitchen sanitation. The crossing of over of things right. in your house. Right. Like right. the cross contamination inherent in the hair dryer. And so there was this guy um who flipped out at me on Twitter, and I can't remember his name, but God, he was just amazing. He was this titanic, amazing man who was like, the recipe that you have for chicken here. So like underneath my whole thing that I wrote in The New Yorker about this, I had a recipe for making roast chicken. And I have a per- like a peculiar way that I like to cook the chicken too. So it wasn't just about the hairdryer. It was also this cooking method. And I had something where it was like, you know, use an instant read thermometer in the breast and the thigh until they are like, I don't remember what it was, like 180 and 165 or whatever the correct temperatures are um, to tell that your chicken is done roasting. And he was like flipping the fuck out at me. And he was like, you're going to kill everybody who eats this. And I was and like, everybody knows that the right way to do this is you just rub oil on a chicken, you put it in the oven, you cook it until such and such a temperature and then it's done. And I was like, wow, thank you, dude. Um, So, OK, here, here I found the tweet. So like this guy, Chris, I, I like responded to him kind of sarcastically when he was like, just rub it with grapeseed oil and bring it up to temperature and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, my God, you know, thank you finally for showing me the truth. Like, how could I have been blind for so long? Which is, you know, not super flattering to me that I responded sarcastically, but it's the Internet. Um, And somebody responded to me kind of implying that he was mansplaining. Um, which, you know, he's a man and he's telling me how to do this. And who knows if there was a gender component or not. But by definition, but, it was close to that. Yeah. Um, so he replies to this person. And this is the single thing on Twitter this entire year that was the best. Here's what he replied. This is not sexism. Fact. I have roasted more than a quarter million chickens over 15 years. What's your qualifications? It's a real Kenny Rogers there. I know. And I was just like... I mean, it was like the sun coming out from behind the clouds. Like, it was beautiful. And I think that, like, and I, I, I don't mean this in a mean way. Like, there is such a purity to his rage. He was like, I've cooked, like, like more chickens than the population of the state of New York. Who the fuck are you? Like, I have a method. And, like, of course, it kind of came out that he works at a, like, chicken restaurant and he's cooking chickens uh, in extraordinary volume at, yeah. in a commercial context. And I'm like, I'm making one chicken at a time for a dinner guest. But, um, God, like, I have cooked over 15 million chickens or, well, no, sorry, a quarter of a million chickens. I'm wildly misrepresenting. But it was a high amount. Oh, my, like, I, I don't know. I was just, it delighted me. Anna, what's another interview that really comes to mind? I also love sitting down with our colleague Francis Lamb. He's an editor at Clarkson Potter. Um, he's a journalist himself. He is the host of uh, Splendid Table, 
Um, but I have been reading his writing for years. He used to write the Eat column at the New York Times, where he would sit down with home cooks and sort of learn how to cook dishes from them. And um, these really beautiful stories always mm-hmm. came out of that that sort of like practice of yeah, just going we, to people's kitchens. It's a great series and we talk about internally sometimes when we're booking our stories and working with writers that we want to strive for that that grace and that expertise and that knowledge and that voice that all comes together in a Francis Lamb piece and I think um, I, I hear The Great Fine he's doing a little more writing this year so I'll look forward to reading him. He hasn't been doing much writing in the previous couple years. He's been busy editing books. He was yeah. um, he's of course the editor of Chrissy Teigen's books. Yes. He's my editor. He's uh, the editor of Koreatown by Matt Rodbard and Dookie <laughs> Hong. <laughs> Let's do that plug. Last time we can do that plug Koreatown the book I do Dookie Hong. Also Dookie Hong's interview was pretty great. It was. Yeah. Shout out to that. <laughs> Yeah, Francis is an incredible editor. We also talked about just, like, what he wants to see in cookbooks, like proposals he'd love to see on his desk, what he'd like to see more of just in book publishing as an industry. Is it hard to strike that balance when you're working on a cookbook between wanting it to feel really like urgent and relevant to the internet age but also like you're creating this kind of permanent object oh that's really interesting um i don't really think of it in those terms like i don't think of it in terms of like oh what's the book versus you know what it would sound like if it wasn't a book Mm -hmm. um i think every book is different to be honest with this i don't i don't feel like that's a distinction that runs through my head like in general, as an editor, I feel like the most important thing for me is, does the book sound like the person? And if that person is going to say things that aren't, like, entirely grammatical or say things that don't, like, don't feel written, I kind of think that's great. And it's my instinct to say, no, let's preserve that because that's why people want it. They want you, right? Like, I think it's really important for them to sound like them. And for if that sounds a little bit off to your ears, but you don't exactly know why, that's actually kind of gold. Mm -hmm. It's weird, but it's weird because it's them. And it sounds like, again, a human being, a real person. And I think that's so important, especially in, to bring it back to the internet, especially in the internet age. Because, look, who the hell needs a cookbook for recipes? Like, if you want to make chicken tonight, you can go Google chicken recipe and you have more chicken recipes than you'll ever make in your entire life on the first page, right, that Google pops up. And so I feel like for a cookbook to actually make sense in the world as an object, it needs to be something more than just a collection of recipes. And in this particular case, it's got to sound like the person behind it because you care about that person. I think I have one final – there's so many favorites. It's hard. I, I, we can't. We could talk about every interview because I think they, a lot of them, most of them are, are worth checking out. But I think my favorite um, was Ruth Reichel. Really, Ruth Reichel. Wow. It was so good. The thing um, that's hard to grasp with Ruth is how much she reads. She reads – New writers, younger writers, older writers. She's so well read and so she keeps up so well. So we talked about her early days um, and her first cookbook. and At age 22, yeah, right? In the 60s, right? In the in maybe the early 70s, 60s, late 60s, early 70s. Yeah. And how it was a totally different business. But we talked a lot about what went into that first book. After the episode aired, my father, bless him, he bought me her book. That's on so Abe. cool. I remember you guys talking about the book in the conversation and her mentioning that they go for like a thousand dollars on Amazon. Which now. was a little hyperbole. It was definitely not that yeah. much, but it was it was a really nice gift my father gave me as a gift and uh, it's a really cool book. Like, it's crazy. The art direction is weird. It's so weird and cool. Her her friend was like a visual artist and did all the did all the photography. Yeah, just so much more experimental than any cookbook you would see these yeah. days. And someone just like 
hearing that she was a good cook, decided to pay her in advance, <laughs> yeah. like basically like a year's salary yeah. to write a cookbook. It's, hey. That doesn't, yeah, it's cool. Doesn't happen in cookbook publishing too often. <laughs> it does happen though. We, we can't sell out the cookbook publishing world, but oftentimes the the advances aren't a year's salary to just do the book. And she was able to get that. But I do agree with you, Anna. She really talked about modern food writing um, and how she's read many, uh, many of our colleagues in food press. And I think she it was just re- remarkable that she's actually reading and writing. I, I love her writing. I mean, I, I, I read her website, RuthRachel.com. She writes dispatches often. And those are really good. Yeah. And her latest book, Save Me the Plums, is really great. Yeah, we didn't get into that because it was before the publication of Save Me the Plums, but we definitely we loved that book. I think it was a really cool look at gourmet and f- just her time there. What themes are you seeing in food writing right now and what are you most excited about? Okay, this is what I'm most excited about. When when I took over Gourmet Magazine in 1999 and I said to the people who hired me to Condé Nast to my publishers Food is much more than recipes, and I'm I want to publish more than just you know recipes and restaurant suggestions and you know how to spend your money on traveling. I mean, I think people need advice on you know on science, on government. Um, you know, food is sociological. Um, mm-hmm. It's about race and gender, and they all looked at me like, "Are you crazy?" And today, food writing has changed dramatically, and nobody would say, you know, oh, those aren't proper food subjects. I think that's it. I mean, we could go on, as I said, but I. So many good ones. So many good episodes. We want to close with a couple thank yous because this podcast could not happen without many people. So first, uh, I wanted to thank Deb Perlman and Max Falkowitz and Dan Holtzman, who have jumped in um, for for segments and who've come in and recorded with us. You've heard them answering listener questions out here and there about home cooking, food science, everything you can imagine. Those are those are really those are some of the, my favorite little mini segments of the, of the podcast. We got to shout out Tatiana. Tatiana, our colleague who has interviewed several people for the show over the years, over the year. Over the year and a half. Um, it's like we've done this for like five years, but we've actually done it for about eight years. <laughs> but yeah, Tatiana, I wish we could do more with it. But, you know, I, I want to say I never said it at the top, like the, the podcast might come back. Like really, we've talked about internally that. Uh, that maybe there's an opportunity to do it in future years and future iterations. I don't think podcasting is dying. For sure. We'll be back at some point, I hope. Yeah, I think so. And then uh, let's go back to the thank yous. Like, shout out Pat Stango right here recording with yeah, us. Yeah, Pat, thank and, you. And his crew of engineers at Penguin Random House. It's they've They've been really fun to work with, doing some really, really amazing and creative projects here at Penguin Random House. So thank you, Pat. You're welcome. Yeah, Pat on the podcast. Appreciate that. If you like our theme song, you might want to check out Steve Rydell. Oh, Thanks yeah. to Steve for the theme song. Yeah, that was a good theme song. Air Credits is his, uh, is his group. Um, he also re- records under Hood Internet, which is a DJ collective. Shout out Steve Rydell. Last but not least, Gabrielle Lewis. <sighs> yeah, Gabrielle Lewis, this whole po- this is Gabrielle Lewis's show. She, like, makes this thing sound okay. That's, like, their, her first thing that she does. Yeah, she's been recording and producing for us uh, from the beginning, and she's amazing. She's amazing. She previously was at Food 52 and launched their Burnt Toast podcast. And she lives in L.A. now and works at this really incredible company called Neon Hum. And they're doing, I think, some of the best work in all of podcasting. Yeah, amazing storytelling. Amazing storytelling. All right. I want to, like, wrap it up a little bit. I think podcasting, I believe in it as a medium. I, I, I really am a huge fan of them. Anna, what are some of your favorite podcasts on the spot? We didn't even prep for this. Um, I I actually I like listening to the Bon Appetit Foodcast. <laughs> I know it's a little bit of a competitor of ours. <laughs> you I admit. love the Eater Upsell. Yeah, I do it's too. really like similar types of interviews that we do with chefs, writers, but really funny and smart. 
Yeah, I, I think um, what Amanda and Daniel are doing at Eater Upsell is really fun. I love it. And definitely agree. Bon Appetit, fucking that Bon Appetit. Sorry, I'm going to correct Adam Rep or Bon Appetit. Bon Appetit. It's not Bon Appetit. <laughs> bon Appetit's podcast with Julia and Adam and the crew. It's a really good podcast. I'm also going to shout out some of my other favorites because, you know, I think food podcasts have. I don't want to think about food all the time. I, and I don't. What's Piv- wrong with you? What's wrong with me? I think Pivot is an incredible podcast on Vox uh, with Scott Galloway and Kara Swisher. It's so worth it. They talk about big tech. They talk about politics. It's about 30 minutes every Friday. Love that. Got to shout out Bill Simmons, the godfather of podcasting. What he's doing at The Ringer with his network of podcasts. It's incredible work. Just have to shout it out. It's the end of our last episode, so I'm just going to shout out some of my favorites. But I think what I think Chang's is really good. David Chang's podcast um, on the Ringer Network is worth checking out. Thanks for listening. The Taste Podcast is hosted by Matt Rodbard and me, Anna Hiesel. The show is produced by Gabrielle Lewis. Studio recordings by Pat Stango. Theme music by Steve Rydell. Interviews are recorded live at Books Are Magic in Cobble Hill, Brooklyn, and at Penguin Random House Studios in Manhattan. Visit Taste online at tastecooking.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>